bits of genetic code that show a human migration, heritage. I love those shows. Um, and, and, and I want you to know that right now there is something powerful going on um, in this country. Uh, DNA research uh, for genealogy is becoming very powerful, especially for uh, people for whom um, their genealogies were erased um, by, by um, the practice of slavery. So people are able to finally start tracing back more and more based on genealogy. It's, it's changing the understanding of identity for a lot of African Americans. Um, oh, and then there's one woman right now who's doing resistance genealogy. It's so cool, she, it's so cool. Did you read about that? No, this woman has taken um, uh, any politician who starts coming down hard on immigration or something about, she's going and she's like, oh, you mean like the chain migration that your grandfather and, and yeah, you know, like that? I'm like, oh, would you look at here? You're, oh, mm. Yeah, resistance genealogy. It's important. I especially love that show with Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, um, because he really addresses the complexity of family. And, 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 and family secrets and, and the history of race in this country. He's very deft. He doesn't, he doesn't shrink back. And he somehow manages laughter along with the, 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 the profound moments. Um, a year or so back, my family, some of us got up the courage. Um, my cousin Chicky, my dad, a couple other cousins. And, and we got up the courage and we got up the money and we started doing some of that investigation. And, oh, my cousin has found amazing things. All the stories were, 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 were braiding together these loose threads. Um, and and uh, we were hoping to sift out fact from fiction um, because there, was a, there were a lot of... Um, dubious tales um, from, from, from family members that were less than reliable narrators. Um, it happens. We wanted to find out if maybe a great, great aunt really had come from Damascus, um, or if our great grandfather had come from India, um, or, or if our great, great grandmother was really full blood and Mayan. Um, because of the, the way the British uh, colonialization worked, they pulled people from wherever they had been and moved them around, right? It wasn't just enslavement. It was, it was the dislocation of people. So in places like the Caribbean, you have people from India and Africa and, and, and Asia uh, and, and the Middle East because the British would just swirl because nobody then... You, okay, we'll talk about that later. Anyway. <laughs> we were curious... And we hoped maybe our DNA would fill in some of the incomplete stories. Maybe it'd answer some questions. But even before we began, even before we got any results back, I knew what, the, what it would show. I'm a post-colonial mutt <laughs> living in 21st century America. Oh, when I applied to to seminary, there were all the boxes to check. And I said, I will not check these boxes. I am a post-colonial mutt. They said, we'd like to speak with you. <laughs> you see, as a multiracial person, I am supremely ill-suited to speak on the experience of white or black or brown people because I am all of those and none of those. Um, so I must, I must speak from my own experience. I've had some interesting experiences. And I must, I can speak as a person whose family contains the whole palette of human coloration. We have, we, mine is a calico family <laughs> with blonde and brown and black hair and, and hair that is smooth and curly and frizzy and, and, and we have green and blue and brown eyes and freckles and dimples and, and when we grin our cheeks rise up high. We, we have broad shoulders, we have wide feet. 
<laughs> Our complexions range from fair to deep. And we have especially beautiful babies. <laughs> Now, in my family, some of us identify as white, and some of us identify as people of color. So you'd think that we'd be completely comfortable talking about race and identity. You'd think that, but we don't. We can. We have. But in general, we don't. Families are nuts. They're all knotted up, and I started pulling on one loose string, and I, and I realized the reason we're not talking about race and identity in my family quite so much is because some of us are still struggling with passing, passing as white, passing as not colored, passing as acceptable. So here's where I can speak from. The experience of passing, becoming acceptable, striving to be measured by my conduct and intellect while wearing an indeterminate skin. I can speak from a very weird place of holding white privilege and being seen as a not one of us, other. It's a weird place, an unwitting chameleon. Here's the awfulness, though, of passing. Knowing that your father, your grandmother, your ancestors sacrificed some of their own identity to make your life easier, to make it easier for you to go forward. Now, plenty of us have ancestors who sacrificed for us to be successful. But I want you to understand that denying one's own identity tends to leave odd scars on a family tree. Also, we all know, thank you, Dr. Jung, that any time you suppress something, it will come out somewhere else. Okay. As a mutt, I am already used to complexity. By my very birth, I have become complex. And I find that the whole white-black racial labels are so limiting and dangerous because it allows for convenient boxes and people don't live in boxes, right? Like I did with seminary, I will not check these boxes. In my family, we refer to them as the goddamn boxes. <laughs> well, we're not Pacific Islander uh, that we know of. Didn't come back on the DNA. There will be many ways that we will dismantle systems of racial oppression. But we're not going to do it rationally. And we're not going to do it all at once. But this is our work. So to start this work, may I invite you to walk with me a while? I can't ask you to fully understand this weird place that is my identity, but if you would accept my invitation, as we walk together, we might begin to see places where you are also weird. <laughs> I'm going to be bold. I'm going to suggest that there are plenty of us who are quietly passing in different ways. Perhaps, like me, there were parts of your family that were not fully acceptable. Not, and now, uh, as you were growing up, 
things that were not spoken of, um, things that were not written down in the family tree, <clears throat> written or, 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 or oral. Because in the work of becoming acceptable, families routinely would edit, prune their histories, sometimes consciously, sometimes out of fear. Maybe the family name was changed at one point to make it more acceptable to English-speaking ears. Maybe there was alcohol or drug addiction that twisted one branch of the family tree. Mental illness, um, domestic violence, poverty, illegitimacy, abandonment, uh, adoption. Um, maybe at some point your family were called ugly names or denied opportunities because they didn't speak perfect American English yet. Like my friend who said they changed the family name during World War I because it was German and they were being harassed for being German. So now they have a very nice English name We have this, we have this um, very strong, stable myth and story about immigrants who come to this country and for, for the opportunity and, and how they can finally bloom. Let me tell you, though, for some immigrants to this country, the upheaval and the culture shock is indelible. It leaves them weak and unstable. I, I know that my own immigrant grandmother never quite got used to being colored. It warped her life in America. There are other forms of oppression. I know that my other grandmother was fiercely intelligent, and yet she had to kind of slide sideways through a world where women's lives were completely circumscribed by domesticity. Potential blunted. As part of this walking together, I would invite you to go back into your own family. Look, look for the gaps in the story. Look for where things don't quite add up. And, and remember, families are not. But pull on those loose threads and see what tightens up and what comes undone. Go see, was there a time in your family where any part of your family was unacceptable? How did they finally manage to pass? And what was the cost, if there was one? Was there a cost to your grandfather, to your mother, to your aunts? Go back and try and remember what stories did they tell you, to show you that they had succeeded. Because buried inside those stories of success are also the quiet warnings. Don't go back. Don't ask. Don't undo this work. Because in those stories, you're being reminded that being unacceptable is dangerous. And the people who tell you these stories love you too much to see you go back there. Now, as you do that work, you take these stories, you take those fears, you understand that sacrifice, and then you wear them. Breathe into the danger and the tension. Feel the complexity of benefiting from sacrifice. Spend some time getting used to that complexity. And then when you're feeling really brave, go ask. Did your family benefit 
from oppressing other people. Go examine that possibility. It's okay to be objective at first. But I won't be surprised if you find somewhere that there was a person whose potential was blunted in laboring so that you could succeed, so that you could pass. Hold that person in your mind as you consider how will you go forward. Perhaps that person claimed your parents' home. Perhaps that person tended your yards. Before we can learn to hold full empathy for another who seems different, we need to integrate, resolve the shame or discomfort that we might be still carrying from our families unwittingly. By looking at the compromises and struggles that were made in the past, we can better honor our families and honor the struggles of others. This is our work. Then once we've looked back at our heritage, the work doesn't end. Um, the next step is to look at our own selves um, because there are ways that we might be silently passing, hoping um, that she won't be looked at too closely, hoping that she won't be judged too harshly. Um, it's a challenge for us because too often I hear that our Unitarian Universalist congregations are too homogenous. Um, they're, they're too white. They're too affluent. They're too overeducated. And I hate that phrase. <laughs> Let's go with well-educated. Thank you very much. Um, I hear people wringing their hands. Oh, we're just so... And I say that's an easy stereotype. But it's too easy. It's too simple. And frankly, it's wrong. Because we are not part of some fictional place where all the women are strong and the men are handsome and the children are all above average. No, we're not. We are more complicated than that because we're human beings. And just like our families have been shaped by adversity, all of us who come to this fellowship have struggled somehow. And some of us are still struggling. I want you to know this still struggling to pass by not acknowledging our whole selves, our complicated identity, or our inconvenient situations. Um, some of us are grappling with economic insecurity, um, just getting by and having to make tough choices between the medicine or the payment of the car. Um, um, some of us, we, we come on Sunday morning and we smile and we, we don't mention those hard choices because we want to be seen as uh, completely acceptable. Um, some of us are grieving terrible losses. And, and the rest of the world seems to think that we should just be upright and, and optimistic. And, and so we, we come on Sunday morning and we look thoughtful, but we, we don't mention that our, our hearts aren't done, um, maybe won't ever be done being undone. Maybe it's hard staying sober. Or maybe the medication isn't quite working well enough. Um, maybe it's really hard not crying when you see uh, a woman holding a baby, even though um, the abortion or the miscarriage was a long time ago, that the tears just come up. Um, but we come on Sunday morning, and we hope that nobody asks us anything too personal. Um, I want you to know, it's quite likely, that someone this morning thought, 
I can't, I can't go to the UU this morning. Um, people will see me and they will think I don't belong there. And so they're not here with us because they weren't up to the effort that it takes to pass, to meet our standards of acceptability, whatever they imagine those might be. So this is the problem of passing for normal, um, successful, affluent. Um, this is why it's problematic, because it denies the full range of our experiences, and it, it prompts us to edit out or suppress the problematic parts of ourselves and our identities, and it denies us the chance for wholeness and connection. As a species, we need connection. I often tell people that church is a place where we come together to learn new ways of being in the world. And we learn best by experience and experiment. Of the things we will learn is how to dismantle racism and other forms of oppression, and we won't get it right the first time or even the second time. But we have to keep trying. This is our work. It's the work that will heal our world. And, and like anything, we have to start with ourselves. When Rabbi Jesus asks us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, you know the hardest part of that is the second part, loving yourself fully. But it gets easier. Breathing. It gets easier if you think about the people who have already loved you forward. Your family, your friends, your partner, your teachers. They saw something beautiful in you and they loved you forward. It might have been an imperfect love, but it was love. I want you to go look at that love that pushed you forward and see if its momentum can push you a little further to greater love and empathy for others who are working to be accepted, not just acceptable. This is our work. As your minister, I'm here to do this work with you. I'm here to hold the fullness of your lives, even the tough spots, even the wounded parts, even the uncertain moments. This is my work. And I am so, so thankful for this chance to be with you. Blessed be.